During the year of 1953, the News Bureau filmed 30 stories for television, many of which were given national distribution by the networks. Just how many people viewed these pictures is most anyone's guess. There's no means of knowing exactly what stations or where they were located that used our films. However, we do know that there is a potential audience of substantially 60 million people viewing television. As of October 1st this year, there were 25,690,000 television receivers in the United States. That's better than one for every other home in the country. Surveys show that two and a half people view each television receiver. A typical of our releases this year are the following. 85-year-old Henry Hockley of Irvington on Hudson, New York, receives his 249th General Electric pension check from President Ralph J. Cordner. The presentation marked the 100 millionth dollar paid by General Electric to its 14,000 retired employees. In personally presenting this check at Mr. Hockley's home, Mr. Cordner said, Mr. Hockley, I want to congratulate you and give you a of a silver dollar that uh, personifies the hundred million silver dollar that has been paid by the General Electric Company to pensioners. You're one of 14,000 living General Electric pensioners. And I think you're the only one that has been retired and still on the pension roll for 21 years. I want to congratulate you and wish you many, many years of continuing happiness. Mr. Gordner, I thank you very much. Handing me this check and this momentum is a big honor. And I certainly cherish it very much as something I never expected. Such things only can happen in this wonderful country of ours. Such people won't happen anywhere else. Again, I thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hockley, who retired 21 years ago, spent most of his 42 years with GE in building and developing electric rheostats a device for varying electric current, such as used in turning up the volume on your radio or operating Junior's toy train. After Mr. Hockley shows one of the old type rheostats, such as he worked on, President Cordner shows today's model, pointing out to Mr. Hockley his fundamental ideas still hold good. The world's largest man-made sphere, a steel shell equivalent in height to that of a 14-story building, and approximately 100 times larger than this plastic model, is mushrooming out of the earth at West Milton, near Schenectady, New York. When completed early this year, this huge ball will house a section of an actual Navy submarine hull, containing an atomic power plant now being built by General Electric for the Atomic Energy Commission. A part of the submarine's hull will pass through a huge circular tank of water, thus enabling the atomic power plant to be tested under conditions closely approximating those encountered at sea. 20,000 yards of concrete have been poured into this giant 179-foot saucer, a foundation on which the huge sphere will rest. A temporary 424-foot steel tower has been erected in the middle of the saucer. This will be used to hoist the 4,000 tons of steel plates of the sphere into position for welding. Once the sphere is completed, the tower will be taken down. The atomic power plant has many advantages, as explained by GE's nuclear expert, Dr. K.H. Kingdon. The nuclear power plant, which will be housed within the spherical building you have just heard about, is a brand new development. Heat will be produced by the fission of atoms of uranium-235. This heat will be transferred to a new coolant, namely liquid sodium, and used to make steam and drive a turbine which could propel a submarine. There are two novel things about this nuclear heat source which make it especially suitable for driving a submarine. First, the nuclear fuel is so concentrated that a cubic inch of it could drive a submarine around the world. Secondly, the nuclear fuel needs no air to aid in the generation of heat, so that the nuclear submarine can operate submerged just as well as surfaced and the time of submergence will be determined more by the stamina of the crew than by the exhaustion of the fuel. These special properties of nuclear fuel 
seem to open up new possibilities in submarine operations and make this development interesting and important. Latest thing in diagnostic X-ray, a unit that rotates through 180 degrees on a ring. There have been other X-ray tables that tilted, but none as compact and versatile as this one. And why does a patient have to be rotated? Well, these unusual positions are necessary when looking for tumors or other lesions of the spinal column in making x-ray studies of the digestive tract and in other examinations. A special heavy-duty foot strap supports the patient who literally hangs by her heel. The equipment makes possible the saving of thousands of dollars in hospital construction costs. For among other things, it takes up far less space in the x-ray room. In addition to making for quick, easy fluoroscopic examination, the unit is used for taking radiographs, of course, including lateral radiographs. Just one of a number of new applications of the x-ray emerging from General Electric's x-ray department at Milwaukee. Here, skilled craftsmen render in glass, metal, and other substances the constant changes in technique and equipment worked out by the engineers. Glass blowers fabricate the complex tubes in which are generated those all-important X-radiations. The two main components, anode and cathode, are mounted inside the tube, then the glass is sealed to the metal base. Special glass must be used to withstand the tremendous heat generated, to bond firmly to metal, and to take the bombardment of X-rays passing through the tube's window. X-rays that will penetrate the human body and detect or cure disease. X-rays to stream through the tools and products of industry and uncover imperfections. Here's a unit that can tell in a split second whether a sealed can is properly filled. Too much or too little, and it sets off a warning light or an air valve that blasts the offending can off the line. And here's a new midget type industrial x-ray unit. Although it's light enough to be carried by hand, it generates 250,000 volts of electricity enough to create x-rays that will penetrate a three and a half inch thickness of steel. From the frequency changer mounted on the trailer, cable carries current for the unit to the most remote corner of a shipyard or factory. In this plant, a pipe joint in a high pressure system is suspected of being weak. Instead of shutting down the system, taking it apart, and transporting the joint to an x-ray machine, they bring the machine to the pipe. A film is taped to one side of the joint, and x-rays will be directed through it from the other to record on the film the exact condition of the metal. Although x-ray was discovered nearly 60 years ago, thanks to modern industrial research, it's still finding new, important jobs to handle. The daily feeding of 100 head of cattle is a real chore to most farmers, but not to J David Chernoff, Oneida County, New York State dairyman. He does the job in 13 minutes. He had an idea for a calfateria for cows, and General Electric and Cornell College of Agriculture specialists designed the equipment. At feeding time, Chernoff simply presses a button to set his silage cutter and conveyor belt lunch counter in operation. The noise of the whirring machinery acts the part of a dinner bell for the cows. With a moo, which in animal language probably means chow is on, the cows leave their straw matted loafing barn and start across an open court to the calfateria. In orderly fashion, the cows line up before the movable belt, awaiting the chopped silage, and thus the night's chore, formerly requiring the services of two men, is over. The farmer's electric bill is but $15 a month. And as Chernoff says, where can I hire two men for this kind of work for $15?
For testing jet engines for the Air Force at high altitude, this four-engine Boeing B-29 bomber has been converted into what is known as a flying laboratory by General Electric engineers at Schenectady, New York. Special instruments and controls make it possible to record every function of the jet under conditions it ultimately will be flying under. Once the bomber has reached a desired altitude, the bomb bay door opens, and what resembles a bomb is the latest and most powerful of GE jet engines. As the bomber soars along above the clouds, the jet begins to function, and for a special test, the regular power plant begins to shut down, as indicated by the gradual feathering or stopping of the propellers. Under the single jet, this heavy bomber is able to maintain a speed of 180 miles an hour as it soars away into the clouds. No more lost golf balls. What a futuristic dream of every golfer. But it may come someday when medical scientists determine it is safe and practical to use radioactive golf balls. What a drive, but oh, what a slice, says Jim Thompson, pro at the Mohawk Golf Club in Schenectady, New York, as he sees his ball go into the rough. As so often happens, the elusive pellet is well concealed in the tall weeds. But Thompson suddenly recalls he teed off a radioactive golf ball. So back to his bag for his golf ball bloodhound, a General Electric scintillator detector, and the search is resumed. This GE detector puts him on the right track. The nearer he gets to his lost golf ball, the farther the needle moves up on the dial until it hits the top. And lo and behold, there's the ball secluded under a wild strawberry plant. A nice stunt, but it isn't practical yet. It may be in 1965, scientists say. In 1929, this vast 28,000-acre area, now forming a reconstructed part of the St. Lawrence River, 30 miles west of Montreal, was a rich dairy country, housing 250 farms. More than $150 million had been spent to date in the digging of this huge ditch, biggest venture of its kind since the Panama Canal, and before it is completed, another $100 million will be spent. The deepening of this enormous canal has been materially helped with the building of the world's largest all-electric hydraulic dredge, especially for this job. This 12-foot revolving cutter, with its giant-sized steel teeth, digs up from 800 to 1,000 cubic yards of rock and marine clay an hour, and discharges it a half mile away through a 36-inch steel pipeline to the shore. Occasionally, rocks as large as this, weighing from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, are sucked up from the bottom by the powerful pump, operated by an 8,000 horsepower Canadian General Electric motor. The exhaust, a miniature Niagara Falls in appearance, expels from 110,000 to 120,000 gallons of water, rock, and silt per minute. This is equivalent to the water requirements of the entire city of Montreal. As the discharge line is moved and the water seeps away, the huge rock pile created by the exhaust is revealed. This canal, 15 and one half miles long, 3,000 feet wide, and from 30 to 35 feet deep, and the ultimate completion of a hydroelectric plant, which will become the largest single power station in the world, will be the source of two million horsepower for Hydro-Quebec's vast electrical network and extend river navigation to ocean-going ships from Montreal to the head of the Great Lakes. In a single day, this woman handled more diamonds than the average jeweler sees in a lifetime. More than a million of these small precious stones are graded each year by Mrs. Marie Downing, better known as Diamond Lil at the Carboloy plant of General Electric in Detroit. These diamonds are not the sparkling kind you'd give your girl for an engagement ring, but of the rough, lusterless variety used in industry. 
This one weighs one half a carat. However, they are valuable, and during the 10 years Mrs. Downing has been on this job, more than seven million dollars worth of diamonds have passed before her expert eye. Approximately 10,000 carats of these Congo diamonds arrive at the Carboloy plant each month from the African mines. More could be used, but the supply is short. Carboloy is so hard it will cut glass, a feat most people feel only a diamond would do. Diamond Lil's fame is well known throughout the Carboloy factory, and she is often called on to appraise diamonds by fellow employees. Rather than break up an engagement or a happy home, she generally grades them A1, even though her trained eye tells a far different story.